Hello and welcome to Mission Critical Service in Broadband Communication. My name is Charlotte Reisner. I'm a new business manager and I work for Frequentis. Today I would like to talk with you uh, about the challenges we are facing in public safety. We are on the way to achieve higher quality and efficiency of services, but we are facing the same resources and budget. And we need to improve reaction time and have the right personal and the right tools on site uh, for every mission. And this in very challenging times because international cooperation is needed more than ever, facing severe natural disasters or that are accumulating with weather conditions or having pandemics as we're facing today with COVID-19. So where can technology help us? And what can they do for us in this very uh, challenging times? Highly available communication networks as we have on, on commercial level can also change the paradigm for operation in public safety. Voice communication are those what we are used to in public safety where we have group communication and priorities of all ca fast call setup. And data communication where we exchange local information or um, localization and text messaging is what is the, the life of today. But adding massive data and adding video group call communication can help to change a lot. Accessing internet and intranet can make your smartphone um, a smart office where you can access all the necessary information from your organizations or worldwide. And that helps you ultimately to have a better overview of situation in incidents that are currently happening. So what does this huge shift in communication mean to operations? Of course, this ability to access this rather vast information gives you a better situation awareness, but not necessarily, because more information doesn't mean that you have good information and that your decision can be made better based on those. And we are here on the road together to find a solution that is helping and improving your service. So what I would like to talk with you today is about new ways of communication, the benefits for your organization, and how we can shape a transition towards this new technologies that help improving your services. Therefore, I would like to give you three major examples which we are facing nowadays. One is a huge forest fire that is raging for days and needs international help because local units cannot cope with. Or a situation where criminals are trying to cross borders and you uh, try to chase uh, this situation and get um, a hold on those criminals even as they are crossing whole Europe. And last but not least, a very severe and, and current situation where ambulance, where first aid should not stop across uh, at the border, but should be helped wherever the incidences are and help is needed. Have a look at the first one more closely. So today, if you have fire, forest fire uh, and you need um, help from the other side of a border, you normally need a lot of manual integration to get this external help successfully joining your group and get in uh, contact with the local chain of command. I think Northern Europe is here more advanced in Tetra, but looking at this across Europe, this is normally a huge obstacle. And it's always very difficult to have the foreign command and the home base um, connected and impossible on the same devices. So what could a pan-European broadway com a broadband communication system do for you? You have first responders that can get the situation information right when they are on their mission, just as they are leaving their home base. Foreign units can be guessed in your home network and can be added as a group 
without switching any devices. You don't need any transmitters or persons who are just trying to translate from one communication system to the other. And even more so, if you're in the border area, you have the coverage of both networks and even the local units could make usage of the, uh, the network of across the border if the perception of their own system is not good enough. And still, home bases are contacted, can help to steer and uh, support in case uh, the situations are changing quickly. But what do we need for that so that we can make this happen? I think a standardization is the key here from bottom to top. And of course, if using um, any kind of commercial networks, you need to, uh, to have roaming agreements uh, and set up here. And not, last but not least, supergroup management is needed on a European level. Another important and very common case is that criminals try to evade persecution by crossing borders. And border control is extremely difficult. And um, as soon as criminals are leaving a country, they are probably um, uh, out of sight and can be, um, can be helping, can get off. So, if you want to have uh, a chase of criminals across borders, normally you need a long-term planned mission, which is not suitable for very current situations. Even here, what can a pan-European broadband communication system do for you? You could set up a mission right in real time, as it's needed, and you have all chains of commands of all nations updated, and reinforcement can be done on the local countries where the chase is happening, actually. And you don't, and for the forces who are chasing, you have no switching in groups or cut or any kind of configuration changes, which are really difficult when you are in field in such a severe incident. But what do we need also here as a prerequisite? Besides the standard-based networks uh, and the integration with, with legacy networks, you also need rules and regulation for the organizational part here on a pan-European level. And I think even as technology might be quite at the point to, to make this happen, I think it's very important that also organizations have the operational rules and regulations to do so. Another very important case is e-healthcare on a pan-European level. What we are facing already today is that first aid is across borders and ambulances are helping on each side of a border no matter where the incident is happening. And for them it's very difficult to have also experts at the hand if there is an urgency. And it's almost impossible to know any his patient history prior to facing incident. Here, the pan-European broadband communication system can help you because you have dispatchers who have an overview of all ambulances and resources, no matter which side of the border and which uh, organization they belong to. And the vehicles can communicate with one equipment for it all, which can be sophisticated that they get in diagnostic information or distribute uh, and accumulate patient history and connect with remote experts for additional advice. And what do we need here to make this happen? Of course, security here is a very, very sensitive part, especially using external devices via Bluetooth. And of course, having data confi confidentially for this patient is, needs also further legal regulations and rules. So these are three very common cases we have uh, chosen, which are showing how much additional communication skills and, and technologies are needed. When we look at a communication system, we have all kind of different um, situations uh, and parts. So which are, the uh, which are the parts, if not all, who need these functions? First of all, we have the user equipment, yeah? Can be vehicle-mounted ones, can be smartphones or tablets, 
all kinds of user equipment uh, a special um, organization needs and sees fit for. This is not stopping at, at kind of tablets or, or smartphones. It can be also all kind of uh, Internet of Things here, Internet of Life-Saving Things. So we are thinking of smartphones, body cams that are already online and uh, contributing to the situation awareness we want to achieve. These get access, access via commercial antennas or setups from, from private, can be even accessed by satellite if needed. Then we have the la layers of networks and, and transports where we have a heterogeneous group, can be national uh, solutions that are connected via roaming. And last but not least, you have the IP-based uh, supporting networks where you have all the applications on top of it. You know this as voice over IP, but here I'm talking about mission-critical services and this uh, service applications. But why do we not have this today? Because we see a lot of commercial infrastructure building up. We have our cell phones, which we can use across Europe. And why is this not in public safety yet? Because it has a very different uh, setup and different needs. When you look at a, a commercial infrastructure, you are talking about millions of users. A critical infrastructure is about some thousands, ten thousands, or maybe hundred thousands max in, a, in huge countries. But it is quite a, a different group and size, and of course a different budget. Commercial uh, infrastructure user-driven. So the coverage is where the most users you have. It's rather focusing on, on uh, cities, while a mission-critical infrastructure is geographically driven because you can't anticipate where you have any incident, and it could be on a very remote area, especially when we think of the use case of forest fire. It's normally an area where there's no good reception. Priorities. When we look at this, normal, it's equal rights in the Internet and best service. But in a mission-critical infrastructure, you have to be sure that there are priorities because they are saving lives. An emergency call or a chain of command has to go through, even if the network is on a peak load. Reliability and availability is often a commercial, uh, done under commercial aspects for a, co uh, for a commercial infrastructure, while a mission-critical infrastructure has extended demands on this. Back battery backups are not for hours, but have to last for days so that antennas can work without a power grid for long times when there is a major disaster. Security has in, been introduced to commercial infrastructures, but on a very basic level, and that's not sufficient for mission-critical infrastructure. The data from, uh, from all these uh, conversations are normally owned by, by the uh, commercial companies, while in mission-critical infrastructure, this is a legal issue because federal organizations need to have their rights and their ownership on their own data. So, and when we look at, at the key non-functionals here, the key requirements, when we look at what the network has to be like for mission critical uh, services is, of course, availability is target already in existing networks, but anytime. So also, if there's a major incident and you are on a peak load, you have to go through um, and have the emergency calls getting to the destinations um, needed. And anywhere, we already said there is uh, always an area in the geographical uh, part where normally commercial infrastructure is not focusing at. And the resilience of a network like this has to be also above current level. And I would like also to, to um, stress the point that we have also other issues like performance, 
where um, we are used in commercial networks to have huge download rates because this is what's normal for users. But in a um, mission critical infrastructure, you have at the same time also huge upload rates needed when videos are coming from the field. So also quite a different usage and a different request on the on the system property uh, priorities and a system uh, function. On the other hand, dedicated spectrum is discussed in many countries and quite heatedly discussed, and it's, it can be uh, an incentive, it can be an advantage, it's probably not a must-have. These are the current functions we are having when we are looking at the communication in a mission-critical uh, blue light organization. You have the classical group, communications and individual communications. You have broadcast calls, um, incoming and outcoming, and simple text messages, uh, location information. So this is what you have to achieve as a bottom because this is what the current state is already. But what comes now is the additional information on a massive way, which you have not experienced so far, and you need um, also the transfer of, of images uh, needed or even go with uh, control commands if you are drone f flying drones. And adding here is that group call and private call can be not audio only, it can be with pictures. So having video call can give a lot of information about the situation currently happening. And not last but not least, of course, when we look at the pan-European level, this means for sure that we have also user authentication as we have, but all this group um, and supergroup management that should be on a pan-European level. And this comes, of course, with a whole ecosystem of devices uh, which help you to innovate and give this a, a complete picture. And I'm talking just about diagnostic systems that adding information, smart sensors, all this shall help you with the new devices coming up and this new generation of devices to help to anticipate and uh, assess a situation on a level which you have not experienced before. So all this looks very, very far-fetched and kind of future, uh, far off in the future and many, many years ahead. But I think it's less, less ahead than you might think on a technology-wise. There are initiatives which actually are focusing on having these pan-European networks ready to help um, today's uh, blue light organizations. So one of those, and a very important one, is um, a research in, um, project um, coming from Horatian 2020 where the, the there are more than 1.4 million European responders um, included um, to, to see what we can do on that level. And they're coming from 11 countries. Um, also, the suppliers are a huge group of um, many countries in Europe, if all disciplines. And currently, there are demonstrations in more than five countries with all kinds of different network setups to achieve this pan-European solution. Where are we standing here? Because it started already, um, I think, about two years ago, where there was a phase zero, where all the requirements, like we said with the use cases, were gathered up and, and see what is needed to have a system fit for this uh, application. And currently, there is the Broadway uh, project, which has three phases. The first one was a solution design. The phase we are currently at since July is building prototype development and showing um, that there are the functions and skills of a network is ready on a prototype level to achieve this. And by mid of next year, there will be the third phase where there are real field tests with practitioners to see in real life scenarios how this network can help and improve operations. And ending one year later in 2022, 
there is the real commercial procurement ongoing based with all the knowledge given from these former projects to see how we can commercially roll out a pan-European network that helps cross-border um, services. And we are happy to be one of these three consortiums who are currently um, in phase two. So we are one of the three remaining consortiums. Um, so Frequentis is currently the consortium lead. And we uh, have, and we are very proud to say we have 12 very, very capable organizations with us who are majoring experts from handhelds via networks, commercial networks, to mission critical services, control room applications, to the ver and even having practitioners group for assessment. So this is a very, very unique group who has really an expertise that's unparalleled in history. So we have test management external and external security assurance given by an own team. We have two commercial networks uh, with us. One is T-Mobile, the other one is Telefonica. And last but not least, we have Utilsat, a satellite uh, system, the biggest one in Europe with CarSat, who gives the backhaul. We are building our own networks and antennas and also integrate uh, with a legacy like Tetra with our team. We have the mission critical services with our teams. And we have, last but not least, real-time scenarios here in Spain, Malaga, where we can test directly in the city or at the university premises. So this capable system helps us to shape this new world where we integrate, where we integrate um, our first responders with all kind of network structures that should be transparent for them to have this new features and functions that help to shape the different uh, systems. And it's a very flexible system where we are not relying on spe special architectures on the network. And a lot of this is fully, um, fully capable because we have a lot of products already on the market which have been here added. And everything is fully standards so that we can ensure that we have an international system that can be placed anywhere in Europe. And this is our current setup we are testing. We are testing in four countries. We are testing Spain focus on Malaga, we're testing France, we have a network there in Paris and nearby, we have, and where we also integrate Tetra legacy networks. We have Netherlands um, um, mission critical uh, networks based on T-Mobile networks that can be roaming everywhere T-Mobile is also contracted. And we have a strategic uh, pan-European architecture in, built up in Austria that uh, can achieve pan-European groups and, and um, make the maintenance of these uh, different networks. And last but not least, to cover all the other areas in Europe, if needed to be, we have our satellite backhaul. This is tested currently and we'll have a huge uh, demonstration also in April next year. And what are the challenges? Because now showing our pre-demonstration to the customers, we see that, of course, a lot of our systems are already products in operation. The interesting part is how to combine them and how to, to uh, get all these different architectures enveloped so that they are transparent for a smooth operation across Europe. And that's what we are currently showing already facing this in four different countries. And this is what we are very happy to show and we are very proud of that we can show today. 
the next phase is we are also uh, looking at the, at the scalability and resilience of the system and also how this will be performing in a huge uh, setup because this will need it to be tested with hundreds of, uh, of systems and automated tested so that we can make it resilient to really peak loads and huge usage. So now we see that there's a transition coming to future where we have a broadband communication uh, at, at our fingertips and it will shape our different operations. But it means that we have, of course, already our existing solutions and we will not change from one day to the other. So what we need to make sure and what we are already working at is how we integrate existing systems because Tetra functions, as we have major in, in Europe, are needed and also while we are transferring this to a broadband communication, operation has to go on. So this integration, we will partly show this already also in this project, um, is a huge um, point for us and we focus very much on it uh, because we need to be operational, independent and group and regroup teams who have still the old systems and with teams who are already working with new systems. So this is very, very important um, and we, we have a lot um, of applications also for the dispatching groups because they need to know where they are, but they shouldn't be um, prevented from sending the right teams which are the best fit by operations just because communication systems might not be ready or be diverse. So this, uh, there is a lot um, we are preparing and a lot we are also discussing with our customers to have this uh, rollout very, very smoothly ongoing without facing any uh, shift uh, and any back uh, drawback in your operation during this transition because this is important to have a good new system without failing during transition in the existing system. And we have a lot of um, things to show here uh, so that we can have a very good transition here. So this is where future is heading to and we are really facing exciting times. And I'm very happy to show and discuss this with you. If there are any questions, we are ready to help and ready to assist. Thank you.